quite a lot of you here today. Hello. I'm going to jump straight into it. I am Mohale Mashiko. I'm actually the chair, so I will sometimes be recognizing them and not recognizing them. <laughs> I hope to recognize all of you as well, but I don't want any unparliamentary behavior in here. So if you came to Feminist Bash, you've come to the wrong party. I will not recognize you. Okay, so let me introduce the people who will be doing most of the talking. I'm going to start here in the middle. Professor, I like to say that, Pumla Di Neotola. And um, she's an activist an academic and author of please hold up your book and do the telephone quiz thing thank you <laughs> she's the author of rape a south african nightmare and then here next to me is Nedi. and i had a long time practicing how to pronounce her surname because i don't want to butcher people's surnames okorafo yes. look at me <laughs> Yes. Um, she's also a professor and um, an award-winning author. And when I say award-winning, I'm not fucking around. <laughs> Everything she's written has won an award. <laughs> so I think maybe sitting here next to her, it'll rub off on me. Um, I was just telling her off for a book that she wrote, The Book of Phoenix. She'll also hold it up. Yeah. And she's written a bunch of other, I'm actually reading Lagoon now and uh, her latest one, Binti, it's a novella. Aha, uh -huh, she's taken out of the bag. It's won, it's won the Hugo Prize, but they've all just won, 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 so she's a wee now. <laughs> and on the other side is Yoande Omatoso, who is an architect. Yes. Yes. And an author. And uh, her book, Bomb Boy, was uh, published in 2011, and the latest one is Woman Next Door. Please hold it up, Telefon yeah. Quista. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And we're here to talk about feminism, so I'm just going to jump straight into it. I don't want to make any assumptions. So, by a show of hands, who here on stage, I will recognize you just now, who here on stage is a feminist? <laughs> Now I'm recognizing new comrades. Who here is a feminist? <laughs> All right, look at this. <laughs> I love this. Okay, so I think the first question is always, I didn't know what feminism was, but I always had this idea that there were things that were happening around me that were just not right. Um, so I want to ask you ladies, when did you discover that you're a feminist? Or when did you discover feminism? A anybody can take it. And when, and when did we know it was called that? Yeah. Called that? Okay, because because when you first asked it, at first it's great to be here, and thank you very much, and it's an honor, and what I hope rubs off is professorships. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but when you first asked, what I thought initially was, when did I first, when did something um, kind of great mm. And that often happens a lot sooner, a lot, a lot earlier, before words like feminism come up, you know. And, and I think that's a lot more interesting, because that points to something. Tell me about the grading. And, and it was, I grew up in Nigeria, and I remember, I must have been five or six, I was living in Ilefe, and I was, my mom was working, and I was waiting for her um, in the garden, running around and all that, and running and whistling. And um, the, the gentleman guarding stopped me and asked me not to whistle. You know, and I asked him why, and he said, "Because you're a girl." And I remember thinking, "This doesn't make sense." Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't, and I didn't do anything with that. I didn't go to my mother and ask her questions, or you know, nothing became of that. But I, I would—that's the beginning of when. And uh, I think anybody can go through that. It's not just a girl child that has to go through that, but it's, mm. there are times when things happen and it grates. Yeah. And you think that there's something wrong here. Mm. And then along the way, and much later, 10, 15 years later, maybe I guess I started understanding or, you know, or exploring or playing with this notion of feminism. Mm. Um, I think, um, like Yawande, um, I remember being, I, I like to sit strangely, like I sleep strangely, and well, I don't sound strange to me, but I, I kind of contort a lot. And, um, and my parents kind of thought, you know, you know, she's a weird child, it's okay. And so, you know, I like climbing things, it's weird because I'm an adult, I'm afraid of heights. 
But as a child, I was always climbing things. And, and, I, and I like to sit. I'm not going to do it now because it's just too complicated. <laughs> but I like to sit with my legs close to my body in different ways. And I like to hang from things. I still like to hang from things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my mother spent the whole life going, are you comfortable? You look like you're going to break. And I, was, and I remember um, what, an instance, I think I was about maybe five, when my Mfunu came to visit. And, and, and she was used to me hanging, and, 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 but something had clearly happened since, you know, the, since the previous year, the previous visit. And she said to me, and I was sitting with my, with my knees up on my chest, right? Which was, I still like to sit like that, but I'm not going to sit like that. So, you know, with my... And, and I remember, so I kept sitting like this over and over again. And I remember her saying, put your legs down. Put your legs down on the floor, and I would put them down for five seconds, and I would, put, and I would mm -hmm. sit again like this, with my feet on the chair. <laughs> and and after a while, she got really irritated, and she said, "Tato, that my, my mom's name is Tato. Tato, just tell your daughter to stop sitting like that. Girls aren't supposed to sit like that." Mm -hmm. And I also remember thinking, "Girls aren't supposed to sit like that." Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, so that's the first conscious mm -hmm. um, moment I have. I have of, of, of kind of thinking, and, and, and like you, know, I, I thought that doesn't make any sense. It's mm -hmm. comfortable. Like people should sit, you know. Um, so that was the first kind of grating moment. Um, and then in terms of kind of awareness of the word, mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like I then you know I, I was always a feminist. Um, I started calling myself a feminist um, when I was 15 because that's when I heard the word yeah. and I discovered actually it wasn't just me and my friends who, you know, who, 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 who thought certain things about <coughs> girls are supposed to sweep after class and girls are supposed to do this and da, 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 da. I thought all of this, those things were strange. Um, um, but in fact there were lots of other crazy girls in the world who maybe like to sit like girls badly. Um, and, and, and didn't particularly like doing the kind of disciplining um, things that that that, that were supposed to, supposedly kind of natural for girls. So. Yeah. Nadi. Hmm. I think I think um, I've probably always been a feminist as well, and I, I've grown up around so many strong women and and men who supported those women that it was never an issue to me until I got much older and started started looking around me because for me I have two older sisters and we're all exactly a year apart and we were very close and then also on top of that my mother was an athlete and she was highly educated so she was the most athletic person in her school she made the Olympic team in the javelin so that's already something that requires a lot of upper body strength so we've got that she was number one in her class she went on to get her PhD so that's what I grew up with that's that was my mother and then my father was encouraging her to get her PhD and was like reach as high as you can and that's what I grew up around so those are my parents and then I had my sisters and we were all athletes as well so we were deeply involved in sports and because of that you know when when you're when you have that athletic ability you don't really question your strength so you walk around the world knowing that you are strong and that no one can put you down in any way so that's the that's the family that I grew up within so it was only you know just um, as we got older and moving around in the world, seeing how women were treated on the outside, like outside of my little little bubble, that I became aware that there was an issue with um, with equality and with women as a whole. And which is which is really interesting, coming from a my mom coming from a Nigerian background and in a very patriarchal culture. So it's those contradictions were always there, but I always saw that there was an exception to the rule and that I didn't have to follow that path that was set for women. So mm -hmm. so I'd always. It wasn't something that I questioned, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me it was actually something so, so harmless. I was running around with, you know, neighborhood boys and I fell and I scraped my knee and my aunt came out of the house and she was actually quite upset and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, maybe she thinks I'm like dead. Or, and I was like, no, 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 you know, giving her the thumbs up and then she, she called me into the yard and then she was like, you can't keep playing like this. Nobody wants a girl with scars. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? 
these people I hang out with have scars. What are you talking about? But I didn't realize that she meant it's okay for boys to have scars, but for girls not to have scars. And I've been stalking the three of you. So, <laughs> they wanted some online platform in 2015. <laughs> I'm serious, guys. <laughs> Ask what would feminists like to see in 2015, I think. And Yolanda said, it would be great to wake up into a world where women's bodies are not commodities. Where everywhere I look, I'm not oppressed by images in media telling me what I ought to look like if I'm really a woman or in order to be beautiful. And I thought, girl, yes. <laughs> yes. And then I, I want to talk about your book because this felt like it was something that you, you actually directly dealt with in your book because the, the two characters in your book, Hortensia and Marion, are, are older ladies. So there's no real, you know, dressing up to the nines or my boobs are perky or whatever. They're, they're kind of dealing with their bodies aging, as one does, you know. And I think if it had been a book about men, people would have been saying different things about it. You know, mm. it, it's, it's an in-depth look at, hey, hey, what, 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 what. But if it's... <laughs> know if you intended to talk about how there, there are so many pressures on women to look a certain way and we don't really talk about the aging process did you did you deliberately look at these two women and think yeah this is what happens when you age yeah the breasts go south and mm -hmm. yeah you know your body your body betrays you mm -hmm. um, firstly a plus for digging that up <laughs> I'm scared of what else you've done in Africa you don't know the file I have on Idris Elba <laughs> oh dear. Um, and in answer you know firstly to be very honest which is maybe unsatisfactory is that I, I didn't there's not a lot of premeditative stuff around the writing because Often there's a character, and I think, yeah, that's the character, and then I'll, I'll start writing, and these ones, and they happen to be that they're in their 80s, um, but then once I, and, and woman fits in there, and if, if you don't fit in there, mm. then you're screwed, you know, and then, and we have industries that thrive on that, you know, commerce and economies that depend on this pinched, ungenerous um, space. Mm. And, and it's, for me, it's something I feel very strongly about, you know, and so it probably comes out here and mm. it, I feel like it's, it's a recurring theme that I want to write about uh, in different ways. I'm, I'm thinking a lot now about beauty because I'm trying to write about this. What, the, what is that? Mm. What really is that? And I'm, yeah. I'm re reading and I'm looking at art and I'm looking at how we look and, our, you know, when we look, do we see? Mm. We think we see, but do we see? And how do we see? And why do we see that way? Mm. Because I, I want to try, and it, it's, it's like crazy work, but I, it's like trying to look underneath these layers, and there's so many of them over the, over the history, mm. to the degree that it's just, it's just what's so. We think beauty is a thing. Yeah. But how far do we have to go back to understand that beauty is not a thing? Now, before I ask you to read from the book, because it is a it is a spectacular book, I just Thank want you. to know from Pumla and Nedi, where in your in your growth as a feminist did you go? Actually, you know, this shaving my legs and my pits or whatever you go through in in your beauty routine, did you go? Some of it is actually it's rubbish. I'm, I'm okay because I don't shave my legs. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I recognize you. <laughs> Um, well, I think I rejected a lot of that early, really, really early. I've never worn makeup. I've never had any urge to wear makeup. I, I don't find it interesting. I have other things to do with my time. Yeah. So, so, so there's that. The um, shaving of the legs. I, you know, that's something I do because it's scratchy. You know, so there's that. My hair's so, fine. So there's that. Um, I think the, the, when it comes to issues of beauty um, for women, especially black women, it's been with hair. Mm -hmm. that, that battle is a battle that I actively had to fight um, for years. And it was like I had to actively deconstruct a lot of the things that were pushed on me, not from, from my parents, but from just society around me, especially growing up in the United States. You know, I, I had to deal with being called ugly, I had to deal with, I mean, I grew up in a very, very racist 
neighborhood where I had um, especially white boys, I fought a lot when I was growing up, especially white boys who had an issue especially with my hair. There was one time where I was sitting on the bus and, um, and mind you, I wasn't bullied because, you know, I was one of those kids, I was, I was skinny and small, but I was like one of those kids who just, if you attack me, I would just go crazy on you, irrationally <laughs> crazy on you. So people understood not to do that. But um, there was one day on the bus where this, this group of white boys ganged up on me, and they specifically all kind of crowded around me and all spit in my hair. Oh my gosh. Yes, and I was alone, and, and the bus driver did nothing. That's what I grew up with, and that's the, that's the depth of the hair issue, because they just found my hair so repulsive. I had, um, I had teachers who, I had one t particular teacher, she was white, who stopped in the middle of teaching us, this was in third grade, and stopped in front of me, and I was the only black child in the class, and was like, looked down at my hair and was like, oh my god, your hair looks like a crow's nest. And this was in front of the whole class, third grade, you know, wow. and that, that's eight years old. So I had been dealing with this, this issue of my hair for a long time, and it took me, it, it wasn't like um, there was some, like I saw someone on TV who, who had, um, who wore their hair natural or whatever. It was just a gradual awakening, just a, a thought process that I was having. It's, I'm, I'm like, this, this is not logical. Why, what makes the way that my, the hair grow, growing out of my head, what makes it ugly by definition? That does not make sense. So it was gradual that I slowly woke up. And it was by the time I got to, um, by, by the time I got to college where I just was like, you know, enough of this. Enough of this, I'm just going to cut all of this relaxed mess off and let my hair be what it should be. And as soon as I did that, then I was able to really look at myself as a whole and really embrace everything about me. And, and not only say that, oh, there's nothing wrong with me, because I, I think that's only one step in the right direction, but that I, I love what I see, I love who I am. Yeah. You know? and, and it's not be regardless of being black, but because I am black. Yeah. So yeah. It, was, it was a gradual, a gradual mm -hmm. thing. Mm. I think I'm still growing into my body. Um, when I was, and I think, I mean, I, I, I don't shave my legs, I don't, I don't, I don't shave much, just, I don't, well, I have high hairy armpits right now, I would show you, but I don't want to show you my boobs. <laughs> not that it's not that kind boobs. of panel. <laughs> I'm just not feeling like it, yeah. but I will show you. Thank like, you. It's for a pity. Me. I like. I was well, anyway. <laughs> Continue. So sometimes, but you know, sometimes I'll shave my armpits, but like generally, I, I, I I'm not a big shaver. Um, <laughs> of generally, so I just. <laughs> I I can't be particularly bothered. Although, I mean, I, I, I have tried different things. Um, I think that for me, a lot of the, I mean, I can, I, I think the, 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 you know, there's a thing that, that, that there's a phrase um, that Bell Hooks uses somewhere, I can't remember where now, where she talks about living in an adversarial relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when I read that, um, I, it, it kind of resonated with me a lot in terms of recognition, not 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 because it kind of brought me to a point where I thought, oh, I don't want to do that. Mm. But it resonated as a in a sense of I mean I think a, a big part of um, disciplining my body um, happened in school, right? Yeah. So I was a very I was I was a very fat child, and then I was a very skinny teenager, and I don't I don't I didn't change my I didn't change anything. I just kind of puberty hit, and then suddenly I was like bony. Um, but I always, so that's the one thing. The other thing is the hair thing, right? And I went to a black school and, and, and I was never made to feel ashamed of my hair at home in the sense that nobody ever said it was ugly. But I remember the, the pressure to comb your hair. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the same, for some reason, I don't have the same hair texture as my parents or any of my siblings. I have the coarse, I have the tightest curl. <laughs> And so I remember the absolute misery. My parents used to take turns because they both hated it. Because I would, it, it was so painful. Like mine seemed to be the most painful. My siblings were just like, wet, <laughs> done. And then it would be me and they'd be like, trying to figure out different ways of gentleness. So my dad's way was like, 
and my mom is like, right? And they were both trying so hard not to like torture me every morning, but also recognizing that you know you can't send your child to school um, in kind of you know in, in, in the late seventies um, with with I suppose unruly hair. And then getting to school and often getting caned for not having combed my hair. And so as I grew into kind of a young woman, the, you know, and then the coat, the, the plaits, I also hated the plaiting, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. then, then, my, then I suppose part of how they try to manage this kind of not torturing me every day, and they would try to do the super girly plait, your hair sit between the thighs of somebody, yeah. her beautiful pineapple hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> and so you look cute, and I like it. Look, I like the attention of like, oh my God, you look so cute. But I hated the process of getting to the cute, right? <laughs> and then later on saying, I'm not, I'm not doing the combing, I'm not, and then trying to do the relaxers and the perms and the da-da-da-da-da. But you know what? Unlike everybody else, my hair would be unpainful to comb for the first two days. Mm. On the third day, my wow. hair would go home. My hair would be unpacked to be. And so I remember just kind of as, as, a, as, as a young woman, that, so then I would do braids all the time, but everybody who's ever done singles yeah. knows it's great. It first of all, it takes forever. Mm -hmm. And then it's great while they're on, and then you have to take them off, yes. and then the nightmare of like, oh. then it would, I would be back to kind of the primary school girl with the problem hair again. Yeah. And so for me, I suppose kind of dreadlocks have, were, were liberating. Yeah. Yes, I recognize the politics and blah, 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 but really, honestly, <laughs> they were also about. Yeah. Not having a relation, an antagonistic relationship with my own, with my, with, with, yeah. with, with my, with my, with my, with my own, with my own hair. Um, I suppose in much the same way that many people feel about cellulite. Girl. <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 yes, because I mean it's like the correction and the correction and it's painful and the brushing and the, and all of those things which I don't do either. I um, just want to say when you're talking about having an antagonistic relationship with yourself, let's talk about sex. Okay. Oh. There's this. <laughs> no, but let's because there's this idea that because you're a feminist, and I've heard this a long time. Like, oh, you feminists don't. Can I use maybe a little saucy language? Yeah. Okay. I must check. I don't want to. I, I don't want to offend too much. They, they say, oh, you feminists don't like dick or whatever, and then it's just like, what's going on? Just because I have a sense of self and I have a sense of you know I, I belong in the world just as much as you do, I. I don't like sex. And also, why are you centering your penis in, in my, you know, my politics of self? Like, why is your penis important in my pleasure? And it is. <laughs> it is. But not that important that, I'm, that my politics are, are, you know, are pushed by the fact that I don't like, I don't like penis. And I mean, if you don't, that's okay as well because it's got its limitations. <laughs> that people once you started owning your sexuality or because you know once I became a feminist I started uh, apologizing less for you know going for the O I'm very proud of achieving my o orgasm <laughs> achieving the O and I, did, did you find that that was somehow connected to your feminism or were you just about the O from the beginning <laughs> In terms of having sex with myself, girl, <laughs> um, I mean, look, I'm the kind of feminist, I think maybe all of us are, but I'm the kind of feminist that completely believes in erotic justice. Yes. Right? And I believe in entitlement, you know, in, in, you know, I, I, you know, I think, you know, we're all entitled to, to, to orgasms in the variety that they come in, right? Yeah. But I must admit also that it was much harder initially mm -hmm. to, um, I suppose maybe like many women or not, to regularly, <laughs> it was, you know, it's kind of, it was always easy when I was having sex with myself, when I am having sex with myself. Right? And so I think, you know, it's nice to have other people, but sometimes... <laughs> she said people, not person. People. Hey, man, whatever. You know what I'm saying? As long as there's grown people, 
yeah. yeah. And nobody's getting hurt. <laughs> Whatever. Unless getting hurt I is your thing, in which case that's okay as no, well. No, no, no. If you're getting hurt is your pleasure. That's yeah. Absolutely. I mm. meant like getting hurt, but no one wants to get hurt. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so I am. Um, I. I, I, <sighs> I suppose I was aware of what kind of society expects in terms of who I'm supposed to desire, who I'm supposed to have sex with, when and how and. But I must say, of all the things about kind of policing and regulating women, um, that's the one that I found the easiest not to be too bothered by. Um, I don't know what that means. Um, it means we need a bumper sticker, feminists do it better. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, think I definitely, I mean, I absolutely, and I'm not just being funny because it's a room full of feminists. Um, I do think feminists have better sex. Mm. You know, because I do think that it's in your head and the more and love you all with yourself, <laughs> the more likely, I don't know, this is the theory, anyway. And also the more, what I'm thinking is also the more open you're looking, you're, the self-knowledge, mm -hmm. you're asking questions, so it's not by rote. Mm. Because, and for me, I, I don't think that journey is over, because you were saying, when did you, you know, I feel like that's something that's always happening. Mm -hmm. And what, on a more funny side, what I remember, once when I was in a, I was in a monogamous, quite a serious relationship, and it was that time when you're like, okay, let's try and do interesting things, you know. And <laughs> I like the story already. And, then, but, and, and you know, ha and having those conversations and trying to get the you know person in question to come along, um, and it's and it's and it's not necessarily this is not necessarily a story of triumph, but it's just the work. You know, like there's also kind of labor involved yeah. sometimes with these things. And I remember research and books and, you know, <laughs> dates and massage oil and candles. And, and now? You know, and, 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 and some, some really awful situations sometimes. <laughs> the, no, and the, the, the one time, so this, okay, no, I don't know if I should say all this. No, please. <laughs> Not necessarily funny either, but 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 if I think uh, there were things that were amazing, and then there, this the one side maybe that was was interesting was what was happening was I was actually also working to repair something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just about the sex, and um, I'd in, I'd issued an invitation, you know, and said let's do the thing, and it was uh, it was about massage and sensuality, and. Um, I just remember this time, and he was watching television, you know, at the daytime, and we lived together, and I was like, okay, hey, you know, it's kind of you. It's time for the massage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and it, it ended up being a very, if you can think of perfunctory massage, you know, like the opposite of what massage ought to be. Mm. Because, so, so, and I suppose I'm just saying that because there's, in journey, there's pain, there's wounds, there's awkwardness, there's shyness, yeah. there's, and, and, and it's important when we talk about sex, we talk about that, because sex, again, is another thing that's put on television, and it's the big O, and, but that's not the only thing, mm. do you know what I mean? And um, I remember also a, a, a feminist I know, and she was talking, we had a session, you were there, it, uh, at the African Feminist Forum in Harare. <laughs> oh, okay. And She's just uh, checking the context. We had, uh, <laughs> what were we doing? Were we fully clothed? <laughs> we were all fully clothed. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we were, we were having a conversation, a very intimate conversation about sex, and it got, it was, you know, it was raunchy and positions and, but, but. And toys. And toys. <laughs> but we also talked about holding, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and looking and seeing, and so, so it's, it, and I think that's important. Even as writers, it, it's important that we we're not always um, kind of um, th there's a there's a very um, crude way that we just want to go go at this thing. It, this is something so beautiful, so delicate, many leafed, you know. And, and so just listening to the conversation, that's also what I was what I was thinking of. Nelly, do you have something to say? <laughs> To read from the woman next okay, door, since okay. this all started with okay. me talking about your book somehow. I know, and then I suddenly thought I'll read another section, but let me read the one I chose. Now you've just made dog ears here yeah, on I my book. Yeah, I made a second bunch of dog eggs. I told you not to let it. Go. Yeah, no, I'm don't sorry. give feminists your books. But there's any dog ears, born, born, born. Um, okay. 
Marianne remembered the information, hard and small, like bird droppings that she massaged out of her parents. But mostly they had nothing to say about where they had come from. When they claimed not to remember, she understood, even at four, that they were lying. And in the easy logic of children, lying became an alternative to remembering. It became a thing in the world, the way walking had become a thing, the way words and speaking had. Lying became something else to master. Yeah. Marion knew some things about the past. She knew that her parents felt unlucky to have got away when they did, I beg your pardon, felt lucky to have got away when they did from a Lithuanian village they never named for her. They settled in District 6 in Cape Town. Her father <laughs> learned English and encouraged her mother to do the same. He traded well and soon could afford to move the family out to Weinberg, where Marion had the experiences that would become her first memories. She grew into the kind of girl who liked ribbons, but only brown ones, and she hated wearing shoes and preferred not to brush her hair. Marion knew her mother disliked the fact that they lived not far from Mortimer Road, where the shul stood. She disliked that she could see the roof of the shul from the kitchen sink window, where she spent most of her days standing. Having moved away from the most hor horrifying danger, her mother would have liked very much never to see another shul or say another prayer, like closing your eyes to the monster the monsters can't see you. The house in Weinberg had not been large. It had a tin roof and thick white walls that were always rough and cool to the touch. There was a leak that never stayed fixed and a half step up into the kitchen that Marion banged her foot against on a weekly basis. Once running for an unremarkable reason, she knocked her foot on the step hard enough to bleed. Her mother put on the plaster. Girls don't run, she said. Girls never run. Mm. There were many versions of the same admonition. Girls don't chew gum. Girls don't whistle. What do <coughs> girls do? Marion once asked her mother. The question stopped her mother for a few seconds. She was shelling peas. She was showing Marion how to shell peas. Girls crossed their legs when they sat. What else? Marion had asked. Again, a long silence. Girls shelled peas. Thank you. So this is a beautiful book. You know what to do with your money when you leave. Please do the right thing. Uh, Nnedi, I was also stalking you. And um, on your blog, um, people ask you all the time, like, are you a feminist? And you just wanted to get it out of the way. And you said, feminism is a positive, energetic push towards equality that requires female empowerment. And mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, I just read the book of Phoenix and that definitely had a kind of, the, the, exactly what you think feminism is, I felt, I felt it in the book of Phoenix. But I, I also want to know, do you deliberately write strong female characters? I don't even know what strong is, to be honest, I hate that word. But do you write compelling female characters who push the plot forward and their love interests die every time something interesting is about to happen? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that I set out to do that. Um, I definitely don't. Um, every single one of my books, though, I've written 10 now, and wow. every single one of them has a strong female character at the forefront. And it's not that I set out to do that, it's just, it's just what comes to me. But I think that at the same time, um, like I said, I come from a very, a background that, that where I'm surrounded by strong women. And I think that plays a role, but also, when I was growing up reading, I wasn't seeing the types of characters, the types of female characters that I wanted to see. And, and I wanted to see not just strong, um, strong-willed, but, but, but um, compelling, complex, flawed female characters mm -hmm. who did wonderful, great things and also did terrible things. Yeah. I, re I really, mm -hmm. really wanted to see that. And so when I sat down to write, a lot of these characters definitely burst forth. So now we're talking about female empowerment, but before we do that, I'm going to ask you to read something for us because, wow, I spent uh, time on many planes reading the Book of Phoenix and I'm just like, what else has she written? What else can I read by her now? So um, Nidhi's going to read something, something for us. Yeah, I don't know what. This is whatever opens up right now because I don't know. Um, I'm probably going to stop in the middle of this. This is the first thing that came up, which is um, I'm going to read from the beginning of Who Fears Death. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
I don't know where I'm going to stop, but it might be in the middle of something, so I apologize. Chapter 1, The Face of My Father. My life fell apart when I was 16. Papa died. He had such a strong heart, yet he died. Was it the heat and the smoke from his blacksmithing shop? It's true that nothing could take him from his work, his art. He loved to make the metal bend and obey him, but his work only seemed to strengthen him. He was so happy in his shop. So what was it that killed him? To this day, I can't be sure. I hope it had nothing to do with me or what I did back then. Immediately after he died, my mother came running out of their bedroom, sobbing and throwing herself against the wall. I knew then that I would be different. I knew in that moment that I would never again be able to control the fire inside me. I became a different creature that day, not so human. Everything that happened later, I now understand, started then. The ceremony was held outside in the middle of the day. It was already terribly hot. His body lay on a thick white cloth, surrounded by a garland of braided palm fronds. I knelt there in the sand before his body, saying my last goodbye. I'll never forget his face. It didn't look like Papa's anymore. Papa's skin was dark brown and his lips were full. This face had sunken cheeks, deflated lips, and skin like gray-brown paper. Papa's spirit had gone elsewhere. The back of my neck prickled, and my white veil was a poor protection from people's ignorant and fearful eyes. By this time, everyone was always watching me. I clenched my jaw. Around me, women were on their knees, weeping and wailing. Papa was dearly loved, despite the fact that he'd married my mother, a woman with a daughter like me, an Ewu daughter. That had long been excused as one of those mistakes even the greatest men make. Over the wailing, I heard my mother's soft whimper. She had suffered the greatest loss. Now it was her turn to have her last moment. Afterwards, they'd take him for cremation. I looked down at his face one last time. I'll never see you again, I thought. I wasn't ready. I blinked and touched my chest. That's when it happened, when I touched my chest. At first it felt like an itchy tingle, and it quickly swelled into something more. The more I tried to get up, the more intense it grew, and the more grief expanded. They can't take him from, they can't take him from me, I thought frantically. There's still so much metal left in his shop. He hasn't finished his work. The sensation spread through my chest and radiated out of the rest of my body. I rounded my shoulders to hold it in. Then I started pulling it from people around me. I shuddered and gnashed my teeth. I was filling with rage. Oh, not here, I thought. Not at Papa's ceremony. Life wouldn't leave me alone long enough to even mourn my dead father. Behind me, the wailing stopped. All I heard was a gentle breeze. It was utterly eerie. Something was below my feet, in the ground, or maybe somewhere else. Suddenly, I was slammed with the pained emotions of everyone around me for Papa. On instinct, I laid my hand on his arm. People started screaming. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs>